tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. Hot, muggy weather hits San Diego. A chance of thunderstorms isn't over yet. We'll have the extended forecast and tell you why San Diego is becoming a more humid place and a mission to save their sand. Beaches are shrinking in Oceanside. See how people there are trying to protect them. That would be the worst thing, to restore a benefit, have people like this count on it, and have it go away. California expands its food assistance benefits, but people who receive help at the federal level might face new obstacles. We can promote love and acceptance by just normalizing everybody's lives so that, that we don't have this idea that an American is one thing. And out in time, KPBS talks with the author of a new book about the ways representation impacts the LGBTQ community. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Tuesday, July 23rd. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. San Diego is feeling the heat and seeing a chance of thunderstorms. High temperatures were near 80 on the coast and into the 90s inland. This is video of people trying to keep cool, mostly kids, near the county administration building downtown. A warming trend will continue through Saturday. And in a moment, we'll have a closer look at the forecast. The chance of storms brings higher humidity, and weather experts say San Diego is becoming more humid. KPBS reporter John Carroll tells us more about why this is happening. It's part of the reason so many of us love living here so much. Beautiful sunny weather, but inject humidity into the picture and the sunny becomes sticky. That's when what meteorologists call the heat index comes into play. On my phone's weather app, they call it the real feel temperature. But are we really feeling more humid weather in San Diego over the last several years? For the answer, we came to Rancho Bernardo. Why Rancho Bernardo? Well, because it's the San Diego home of the National Weather Service. In recent years, it has definitely been more humid than normal. So there you have it from National Weather Service meteorologist Brant Maxwell. It's not your imagination. It really has been more humid in San Diego County over the last few years. But why? The reason for that is because we've had much above normal sea surface temperatures along our coast during summer. Higher sea surface temperatures lead to more evaporation, and that in turn charges the air with humidity. But there's more to it than that. We've also had a lot of fog recently at night, which once that burns off, you've got some of the mugginess associated with that lingering. The summer of 2018, you might recall, was particularly muggy. Last year, we set an all-time record ever for anywhere along the Southern California coast at Torrey Pines Buoy. We had a sea surface temperature of 81 degrees. A summer monsoon is moving in this week, which will make things even more humid. But is it a long-term trend? Maxwell says there's no way to tell yet. John Carroll, KPBS News. Hot, humid weather will stick around and more rain is possible tomorrow. Paul Williams has a closer look at what we can expect. You're watching KPBS. I'm meteorologist Paul Williams. Take a look at your forecast from earlier. We've had an um, influx of scattered shower activity that's been pushing its way through our portions of Oceanside as well as Poway towards Borrego Springs. Now, oh, we're looking at this moisture that's going to continue to dance in and around our immediate area throughout the morning time. We're watching out for this monsoonal moisture flow to continue to be uh, problematic for us over the next, let's say, 24 to 48 hour period. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, here's a little wider view we're talking about. We see that moisture uh, from earlier uh, rising from the south, lifting its way more so towards the north. We see redeveloping scattered showers uh, from the morning time over the San Diego immediate area. Now, we're not getting much of a push actually from the Pacific at this present time, but even with that being the case, we are expecting partly cloudy skies for tonight. So we're going to get a bit of a clearing that will happen for tonight. We'll drop back to 70 degrees with partly cloudy skies. Now, as we go into tonight's forecast, and forecast rather, an ocean side will drop back to 66 degrees, uh, and then we're going to drop to 70 actually in San Diego with increasing cloud cover. Uh, Mount 
Laguna, 64 should just about do it throughout the overnight period. Now, as we begin to take a look at our expectation for Wednesday, now that moisture, that monsoonal downpour is going to shift more so over towards the Four Corners region. So we're looking for uh, warmer conditions for us. Now, we're going to have some coastal clouds for us for Wednesday, uh, but we're going to stay quiet. So we're looking for that shift in the rain as it continues to lift towards the north for uh, tomorrow's forecast in San Diego. We're warm to about 80 degrees, but there will be a chance of an afternoon scattered shower. Once again, that hit and miss kind of pattern that we just demonstrated on the radar for you. And uh, Ramona, 97 should just about do it with increasing moisture, actually. And moisture will begin to build up with a chance of a, a scattered shower for us actually towards uh, Mount Laguna and 81 for the high. Now, by late in the work week, we're going to see more in the way of afternoon scattered showers throughout a good portion of the Four Corners region, but still far away from us. Here's a look at the five-day forecast for the coast. We're looking for temperatures in the low 80s. Uh, Apache fog on Friday. Be mindful of that Friday and Saturday, by the way. Then on the inland area, we're looking for temperatures staying in the low 90s, mostly sunny and warm really throughout the time period. Low 90s for the highs, mid to mid 60s for the overnight lows. And then end, or excuse me, for the desert, starting at 109 on Thursday, 112 by Saturday with sunshine and staying hot. I'm AccuWeather meteorologist Paul Williams. As California enters its peak wildfire season, the federal government is short hundreds of firefighters. That's according to a report by the L.A. Times, which reviewed documents and memos from the Department of Interior. As a result, federal agencies in California have about 500 fewer staff than expected for this time of year. Some of that is due to the federal shutdown, which happened during the usual hiring period earlier this year. Many Southern California beaches are gradually disappearing and communities on the coast are looking for ways to save their sand. In Oceanside, residents have a plan. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says it's a controversial strategy. This is part of Oceanside Beach near low tide. You can see there's not a lot of sand at this point and the houses on the strand are protected by a rocky wall. As the tide rises, a family wanting to walk down to the beach decides to look somewhere else. Nick Rickey is with a new group called SOS, Save Oceanside Sand. Currently, we're at Wisconsin Street. If you look around Wisconsin Street, we have Lifeguard Tower 7. We have a beach parking lot with a, uh, beach bathrooms, but yet we don't have any beach. Now, just three years ago, at low tide, you'd have some dry sand. At high tides, there's another problem. The ocean sometimes washes right over the strand, threatening homes. City employees have to remove water and rocks that accumulate on the road. Along with sand displacement, city studies say parts of the beach could disappear altogether by 2040 due to sea level rise. Every year, the Army Corps of Engineers lays long pipes down the beach and pumps sand dredged from the mouth of Oceanside Harbor. That's to compensate for sand lost when the harbour was built because the long jetty now stops sand from its natural southerly migration. The sand dredged helps keep the harbour mouth open and adds to the beach. But it doesn't last. If you look south from Oceanside Pier, you can see how the beach gradually narrows to almost nothing. Ricky, who's lived in South Oceanside for 10 years, has seen the beach shrink. He and his neighbours are now looking to Newport Beach for ideas. Newport Beach is wide and generous. Ricky says it wasn't always that way. Back in the late 1960s, the ocean was threatening the homes along the beach. So as a result of that, these the homeowners were the ones who spurred uh, the city into action, which then uh, got the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers to build these groins. 100 yards long, about uh, 8 to 12 feet tall, about uh, 12 to 16 feet wide. The groins are like rocky fingers that run underneath the beach and out into the ocean. The idea is that they stabilize the sand and stop it from washing away. They've been there for 50 years and they appear to be working. But the Newport Beach lifeguards say the jury is still out. They say the groins create problem rip currents. Bob Guza of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla says groins or jetties have another major problem. Building groins to retain sand at one location basically prevents sand from getting down drift. So one beach's gain from groins is the next down drift beach's loss because they took their sand. Sand tends to flow south down the coast, especially in winter. But Ricky says Oceanside would not be depriving Carlsbad of sand if they built rock groins because the Army Corps of Engineers would keep replenishing it every year. Our plan is very unique in that we believe that we will backfill those areas where the groins are with sand 
so that there'll be no stoppage of sand down uh, stream, so to speak. And Ricky says surfers are in favour of trying grinds because they sometimes improve wave action. Guza acknowledges that surfers, the tourist industry and homeowners would probably support building groins to stabilise beaches. Building groins can be definitely an effective way of stabilising the beach at some locations. The question is whether it's cost effective. Is it worth the money? Guza says the San Diego Association of Governments, or SANDAG, spent $30 million on beach replenishment in 2012, and much of that sand has washed elsewhere. He says beaches can be stabilized sometimes for decades, but not indefinitely. We can't stabilize all the beaches in Southern California for the next, let's say, 100 years. It's not financially possible. Which ones do we stabilize? Who makes that decision? And it's a political decision as well as an economic decision. When it ultimately comes to the coast, the decisions are made by money, power, and the blowback from the Coastal Commission that is, that is the mouth of the people in California. Rookie says Save Oceanside Sand is getting estimates of what it would cost to build groins south of the pier, and it's in the tens of millions of dollars. But he acknowledges this is a challenge facing all San Diego's coastal cities. He says his group may end up cooperating rather than competing for resources to try to keep the sandy beaches that are such a symbol of the Southern California lifestyle. Allison St. John, KPBS News. As you heard there, there could be debate among cities over how money to protect beaches gets allocated. In places like Del Mar, rising sea levels threaten beachside homes. San Diego wants to protect its scenery during the rollout of 5G. KPBS science and technology reporter Shalina Chetlani tells us how the city council just approved a plan to install the equipment needed for the upgrade. The city's move toward 5G infrastructure is inevitable. Last year, federal regulators said local governments could face potential legal action if they tried to restrict wireless companies from delivering 5G. But many San Diego residents have pushed back, saying 5G technology can be ugly. It can only work if shoebox-sized cellular devices are installed on poles within nearly every city block. That's why these new regulations require these so-called small cells to be as unobtrusive as possible, says Karen Lynch with the city's planning commission. We've worked hard to revise our regulations and guidelines to streamline the process to comply with the state and federal mandates. And at the same time, we've incorporated high design standards to ensure integration and to protect our communities from poorly designed and or maintained wireless sites. Lynch says the city planners have also created guidelines for the historic districts so they can get specially designed poles. Shalina Chatlani, KPBS News. Millions of Americans could lose their food stamp benefits as the Trump administration moves to close what it calls an expensive loophole. The Department of Agriculture says it wants to change how states determine who qualifies for SNAP, the program better known as food stamps. Right now, many people who receive temporary assistance can qualify for full benefits without proving income. The Department of Agriculture says three million people would be affected and the government would save about $2 billion per year. There will be a 60-day public comment period before any changes are made. While the Trump administration moves to cut benefits, California is expanding its CalFresh program. KPBS reporter John Carroll shows us the new effort to get seniors to sign up. This building in downtown San Diego is dedicated to serving low-income seniors, literally. The Serving Seniors program provides breakfast and lunch, but until recently, seniors who receive SSI benefits were not eligible for CalFresh, which meant they were on their own for dinner. That led to agonizing decisions. Do I pay for my medicine? Do I pay my rent? Do I pay my utility bill? Or do I pay for food? We're trying to get the word out about how easy it is to apply and see if you're eligible for these benefits. Senator Atkins was the driving force behind the expansion of benefits, which is actually a restoration. The state started forcing low-income seniors to decide between SSI or food benefits back in 1974. 
Atkins says the restoration is part of a larger effort in Sacramento. We're trying to be fiscally responsible as we restore over time a lot of these services. Fiscal responsibility also plays a part in the restoration of this particular benefit. It's a good investment, a relatively cheap investment in keeping people healthy and well. My rent and uh, Cox Cable and SDG&E, it's just not enough money to survive because it's so expensive here. Gwendolyn Joseph is Years waiting to ago, hear whether she'll be approved to receive right. CalFresh. She says all low-income seniors should do what she did, apply. It's very good for us, and they should go up there and apply for that because, like I said, it put food on your table. Seniors here today got help with the application process, but if you or someone you know is low income, of any age, you can apply too. Just call the county assistance line at 211 and you'll get the help you need. John Carroll, KPBS News. After less than a month, an emergency shelter for unaccompanied migrant children is closing. Cameras were recently allowed into the Texas facility, which opened in late June. At its peak, it held about 400 children. The Department of Health and Human Services says the last remaining children will be processed and moved out by Thursday. The shelter was operated by a nonprofit due to overcrowding at other shelters. After seven months of uncertainty, the military has a new Secretary of Defense. Mark Esper was confirmed today by the Senate. The vote was 90 to 8. California Senator Kamala Harris was among those who voted no. Esper is the former Secretary of the Army and a former defense industry lobbyist. He says his first priority will be to fill other leadership vacancies at the Pentagon. Early tomorrow morning, KPBS Radio will carry the testimony of special counsel Robert Mueller. CNN reporter Lauren Fox tells us why this is expected to be the most closely watched hearing yet on the Russia investigation. Former special counsel Robert Mueller will testify tomorrow in two highly anticipated hearings on Capitol Hill. The Justice Department issuing him this warning before he speaks, demanding Mueller, quote, remain within the boundaries of his public report because matters within the scope of his investigation were covered by executive privilege and avoid discussing the conduct with respect to uncharged individuals. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. Mueller, a reluctant witness, will appear under subpoena in back-to-back -back hearings before the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committees, facing questions about the 10 episodes of possible obstruction outlined in the Mueller report and about Russian interference in the 2016 election. Some Democrats believe Mueller could help Americans understand his findings. For most people, this will be the first time they will hear what's in that report, what was actually found in this investigation uh, by Mr. Mueller and his team. It's a damning report with, with really disturbing evidence against the president, and I think it's going to have a very powerful impact on the American people. But Trump allies telling Democrats and the public it's time to move on. Yeah, I think the apple is done. Most Americans uh, were looking to Mueller to tell them what happened, not Nadler. Do you think any fair-minded American believes that Nadler is out to get the truth? He's already convicted the president in his own mind. This is all about impeachment. Sources tell CNN congressional Democrats are preparing for Mueller's hearing seriously. These are serious members who are on the Democratic side treating this as the most important hearing that they've had so far in their lives. President Trump downplaying the former special counsel's testimony. No, I'm not going to be watching, probably, maybe I'll see a little bit of it. I'm not going to be wa watching Mueller uh, because uh, you can't take all those bites out of the apple. We had uh, a total no collusion finding. The Democrats were devastated by it. They went crazy. They've gone off the deep end. The Mueller hearing will begin at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time. NPR's coverage will be carried live on KPBS radio and we'll have updates throughout the day on kpbs.org. San Francisco's new airport terminal is the first in the world to be named after an LGBTQ leader. The Harvey Milk Terminal 1 is named after the San Francisco supervisor and activist 
who was assassinated in 1978. The terminal features art installations by Bay Area artists. Today's opening is just the first phase. With nine gates opening, more gates will open over the next few years. San Diego just wrapped up its Pride celebrations, and while June is the designated Pride Month, there's an effort to continue this momentum of acceptance year-round. I'm joined now by Dr. Perry Halkidis, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Rutgers University and an LGBTQ health researcher. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, as you know, June was selected as Pride Month in part to commemorate the Stonewall Riots. Can you just briefly tell us about that period of time and the significance? June 28, 1969 was a historic day for LGBTQ people. It is the day in New York City at a bar called the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village that LGBTQ people of all races, cultures, sizes, and shapes said to the police, you're not going to arrest us anymore. You're not going to come in and harass us anymore. And there began a multi-day set of riots where LGBTQ people fought the police and demanded that they had the right to love and live their lives openly. And that is marked as the beginning of the LGBTQ civil rights movement, happening at the same time as the African American civil rights movement is, the women's civil rights movement happening, and it is marked, June is therefore marked as the historic um, um, indication of the beginning of LGBTQ pride, and therefore we celebrate pride in June. And you've written a book about this period, and in it you talk about the generational differences between gay men and in what ways would you say a, a gay man's experience today might differ from someone a generation before and even a generation before that? I mean, it would be very easy to say it's easier to be a gay man now than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And in some ways it is. There is There are higher levels of acceptance, although in the last few years that's also been on the downslide. Um, there are more representations in the media of LGBTQ people. However, the feeling that a young person has when they're three or four or five years old, of feeling different, of feeling othered, is pretty consistent across time. And the messages that we receive from society, that all marginalized people receive from society, including gay men, that they are lesser than, permeates every single generation. So I think the psychological process is similar. What is different is the representation of LGBTQ people in our society at large. You write that pride should be celebrated year round. Can you explain why that's so important? What I want is a celebration of every person, of every diverse culture, gender, sexual orientation to fill our history books all year long. Only then do we say, look, America looks like this. Until we change that, America continues to be this sliver of white straight men. And can you tell us about, um, there's a chapter in your book where you touch on substance use and the effect of gay men's health. Um, can you expand on that? Sure. I think that what I've learned over my research program over the last two decades is that when individuals are marginalized, when they are put upon, when they experience stressors, when they experience harassment, they often don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with those negative feelings. Substance use is one way that people, not only gay men, but other folks, ameliorate those feelings, lessen those feelings. The problem is when the substance use gets out of control, it becomes a dependence. So my argument is if you want to get rid of substance use in the gay community, you have to have more tolerance and acceptance and love of LGBTQ people. And how could we as a society promote that? We can promote love and acceptance by just normalizing everybody's lives so that, that we don't have this idea that an American is one thing. An American is millions of different things. And by reacting in ways that treat everybody on an equal, equal playing field, that's how we normalize people's lives. And that's how we take away the feelings of marginalization that people experience. What needs to be done to really promote this? So we need structural interventions. And we live in, I live in one state and you live in another state that is ahead of the game. California and New Jersey are the two states in the United States that now require that LGBTQ history be taught in schools. When you start at a very young age, when you include the life experiences of Sylvia Rivera and Harvey Milk and all those LGBTQ leaders in the history books from the, and you teach young children at a young age, that's how you change a society. 
society. And you know, California and New Jersey, God bless these two states. They are so ahead of the game. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Amna Nawaz. Tonight on the News Hour, Congress and the White House reach a two year budget deal, avoiding a shutdown but growing the federal deficit. That's coming up at 7 right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Now here's a recap of tonight's top stories. A chance of thunderstorms will continue through tomorrow. It's part of a pattern that includes a warm up through Saturday. The forecast calls for high temperatures in the 80s on the coast and into the 90s inland. The LA Times reports California is short hundreds of federal firefighters. Documents show a dip in hiring earlier this year during the government shutdown. As a result, federal agencies in California have about 500 fewer staff than expected for this time of year. San Diego City Council has approved a plan for the rollout of 5G technology. Special equipment the size of a shoebox is required for the cell phone upgrade. The city's new regulations call for the installation to be as unassuming as possible to protect neighborhood scenery. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.